I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode 89 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 089. Well, folks, we're going to do this episode just a little bit different this week, uh, or this two-week period. You see, we have... uh, We've had a few technical difficulties elsewhere. This is not on my end, but it's on <clears throat> it's on someone else's end. We'll get into that later. But as a result, we're going to have two different topics in this episode instead of a new segment. And that may have given away who had the technical difficulties. But if that didn't, then this last comment probably did. Anyhow, while I'm, I'm hesitant to say it right now, but I might as well. I've had a number of people email me about uh, about my position on Trump and all. Well, he's not the ideal candidate in my opinion, but he's the candidate we've got, and the alternative is Hillary. If you're not supporting Trump, then you're supporting Hillary indirectly. I don't know how else to put it. Consider this. Donald Trump has his warts. Hillary Clinton is a giant wart. We have the Peruta decision in California. That is most likely going to go to the Supreme Court. If it does, and Hillary wins the White House, we have a major problem. You know she'll appoint a judge that, say, that will uh, decide, well, the right to keep and bear arms doesn't mean you can bear them outside your home. And voila, all this work, all this effort we've had, Heller, McDonald, effectively overturned. We have to get justices into the Supreme Court that will support the Second Amendment. Hillary Dunn said she wants to do away with the Second Amendment, and we're not going to get any anywhere positive with her. It's a scary thought. Anyhow, I'm going to hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show, then we'll come back and we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, let's have a look at our listener feedback. We have an email from someone that's not too far from where I'm at. Saul from Lubbock wrote in that he is an employee of a business that refused to allow firearms, knives, or even prescription medication on their property, including employee vehicles in the parking lot. He said that business that the business searched employee vehicles and employee effects regularly, and he recently had a discuss with their corporate human resources about this policy. Now, when he had this discussion, he pointed out that the state parking lot law kind of prohibited this behavior in some areas, and he also pointed out some complaints he had heard from a diabetic employee in another facility. Or, yeah, okay, I'm I'm actually skipping something here. He pointed out that the, I'm just going back to his email because something got scrambled in my show notes. He pointed out the state parking lot law and mentioned the prescription medication rule is probably in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It turns out that the policies at his location were put into effect after a memo went out to all locations regarding the Texas parking lot law and complaints from a diabetic employee in another facility, and the new policy was in direct opposition to his memo or to the memo that they sent out. Now his location has corrected their policy and all employees who were affected have received apologies and bonuses, i.e. bribes, please don't sue us, to compensate them for any inconvenience. He also said that he has asked to be or he has been asked to be part of a working group to develop a policy allowing employees to carry concealed while at work if they have a license. Saul also wrote that he found out that He is not the token gun guy in the working group, but it is in fact made up almost entirely of people with an interest in firearms. Every situation is different. When you you approach your employer about an issue like this, they may find a reason to render you unemployed. They They may go above and beyond like this one did. It all depends on the employer and uh, who you're dealing with. And we have an email from Dana. You know, she's located in Houston. She sent an email with three questions. And I couldn't reply to her because there's something wrong with the domain that her email came from. When I sent a reply, it came back no MX record, which me, which in 
computer ease means it's not set up to receive email. Her three questions were, can I buy my husband a handgun as a gift? We both have our CHLs. I assume she means, can she buy it with the form 4473 question, are you the actual buyer? Well, the answer is yes. The 4473 form actually addresses this on the form itself. The fact you both have your CHLs just means that uh, when you go to buy the gun, you won't have to go through the background check. And if your husband went to buy the gun or to pick it up, he wouldn't have to go through the background check. He'd just have to fill out the form. Our second question is, can you recommend a good range in the Houston area? And the answer to that one is not on my own. Now, I have not heard nothing but good things about PSC. I'm not sure what the P stands for, but I know the SC is shooting club. And a number of folks from the CHL forum are members of that. So that's where I would start. I would also recommend checking out the TexasCHLforum.com website where uh, you can actually get in touch with somebody that's a member of PSC and is involved in their shooting sports program, which brings us to the third question. Who can I talk about getting involved in competitive shooting? Oh, man. When you find a range, they should be able to help you. Also, I like I said, check out the CHL forum, TexasCHLforum.com. Dana, I'm going to say that if you're in the Houston area, you really need to check out the Texas Firearms Coalition podcast, and you'll learn a lot about the uh, you'll learn a lot about different things. All you got to do is type into your web browser, TexasFirearmsCoalition.com. Once it comes up, there's a podcast in, link in the, I want to say, upper right corner of it. Click on that. You'll see all the episodes they've got, uh, 14 or 15 by now. Or if you're getting this episode much later, it could be 16 or more. I know when I'm recording this, he's got 14. When I release this, he'll probably have 15 episodes. Charles is a great guy. Uh, he's been on this podcast a number of times, both as the Gun Rights in Texas and the Open Carry Report. And I cannot recommend his podcast enough. And he all he actually talks about things from the PSC range. So my advice is go see or go check out his podcast and check out the PSC range. He has a link somewhere in his show notes to that range, I believe. Moving on, Third Coast John wants to know if he will be able to keep his firearms once he moves to Texas. He has been told that Texas actually has terrible gun laws and that you must have an established residency before owning a firearm and you must get a license. He said this advice came from a Facebook group for a local chapter of a group with a three-letter name. He actually doesn't mention the name of the group and uh, the local chapters for where he plans to move to. Well, if I'm not mistaken, this might be the same group that tried to imply that someone under 21 could not buy a firearm in Texas or at least... They were saying that before the legislative session last year, or the last legislative session. The truth of it is, Texas has no such restrictions. If it's something that requires a tax stamp, you got to have the tax stamp. Otherwise, as long as it's a legal firearm in the United States, it's legal in Texas. Do you have to be a resident? No. Do you have to have a license to own? No. You have to have a license to carry, but not to own. A few other things people might not be aware of. Texas has excellent self-defense laws, and I would strongly recommend that if you are wanting to, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it, if you're wanting to move to Texas, I know I've already plugged them once in another listener email, but check out the Texas CHL form. Also, you can type in texasltcforum.com. Either one of those links will work. I'm used to calling it the CHL forum, but texasltcforum.com, check them out. You'll find that uh, anything you need to know about Texas laws can be answered there. With that said, I want an audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. And then after that, we'll come back and we'll hit our first topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, in case I didn't edit that out, I made a little bit of noise there, and I was actually messing with a set of dies I've got. I'll talk about the dies and the 
and the firearm that they're going to be for, they're actually reloading dies, if you don't know about dies. But I am actually looking forward to using those. Okay, something I've noticed recently. We're losing our civility here in the gun rights community. And we got to be civil when we, when we do our long-term thinking. And to be perfectly honest, right now, we have to choose. And the choice we have is the Second Amendment or Hillary. And you may, may be thinking, well, this is not exactly something to talk about civility on. Yes, it is. I want to touch on this, and, I, and then we'll go into why civility is important here. Hillary is completely opposed to the Second Amendment. The devout socialist, the guy who only became a Democrat so he could run in their primary because he is far rat more radical than a lot of Democrats, is actually better on guns from his voting record, from what he has said, than Hillary Clinton. And that's Bernie Sanders. And we all know Bernie Sanders would not be very good on gun rights. Now, everybody, you know, everybody points out, you know, Trump is to a degree an unknown on how he will go. He has no voting record. He has no record of any kind. It's just what he said in the past. Well, consider this. Hillary's not an unknown. We know exactly what she will do. She has made it clear that she wants to take away the Second Amendment. She wants to render it null and void. On the other hand, Trump's sons have educated him on his position in the past, and they have taught him the error of his ways. On top of that, no other candidate has been more vocally pro-gun than Trump. However, a lot of people will look, point to Trump and say, well, not only is he unscripted, he's rude, he's snarky, he's hateful. And this is a problem as a community, those of us in the gun rights movement are having to deal with. And we don't even, we're not even addressing the problem. We're just simply uh, riding it out. Hillary is rude, very hateful. And as everybody knows, you can't get much more you can't get much more hateful and rude than Hillary Clinton, but we have a problem. And unfortunately, we are the problem. You see, we have a civility problem. And I'll admit it, I have fallen here as, uh, as well. I myself have said things that weren't very civil, and it's not what I should have said. We need to return to the Big Tent philosophy about welcoming everybody in, even if they're different. And you'll see a lot of people in the uh, in the gun culture 2.0 movement, they'll tell you the Second Amendment isn't about hunting. The truth of the matter is the Second Amendment is about hunting, self-defense, state defense, national defense, and any other use of arms. After all, hunting rifles were the rifles used by Americans in the Revolutionary War. When somebody tells you the Second Amendment isn't about this or that, they need to go check their facts because if it involves arms in any way, well, it's about the Second Amendment, and the Second Amendment is about it. Now, let's talk about what I want to call gun culture 2.1, although a lot of people will attribute themselves that fall in this category as being part of gun culture 2.0. And everybody knows that minor revisions aren't always beneficial. First off, let's talk about hipster gun owners. These are the people that in the 90s were, uh, how do you put it? Well, in the 90s, you had these folks that all they could talk about was, if it's not a Glock, then it ain't worth owning. Well, guess what? The Glock wasn't as popular in the 90s as it is in the 2000s or the 2010s. And that was their, that was how they moved into, I'm different, look at me. In the 2000s, the 1911 kind of became the hipster gun. It was, well, I've got this really old gun that, you know, by God, it's neat. In the 2011s or the 2010s, we saw a surge in things kind of like uh, the Caracal. It's what the Glock should have been. And other firearms. Well, the hipster gun owners tend to be, they're not like your typical hipsters in the phone movement or the general hipster movement. Hipster gun owners tend to be very outspoken, brash, and in your face. The hipster gun owners will insist that you carry what they carry. You shoot what they shoot. You still see hipster gun owners clinging to their Glocks. You know, you'll see a comment, well, I was at this training class and there were, a, I was the only one with a Glock and there were five people with M&Ps, three people with 1911s and a couple of people with XDs and I had the only gun that didn't malfunction and everybody else, when they come back to the next class, 
they're going to have a Glock. Well, the Glock fanboyism there is what turns me away from Glocks. I own one, a 10 millimeter, and since I got a Colt Delta Elite, I really, ooh, I may not have mentioned that I had a Colt Delta Elite. I don't know, but we'll cover that gun in a future episode. But since I have this Colt Delta Elite, I really don't have a use for the Glock 20 anymore. And now those of you who are thinking, well, I may just uh, send him an email about buying that. It's already spoken for. It's already spoken for, folks. The thing about it is, I'm not one who will who will make a run with something just because it's counter cool or it's cool. I chose the 1911 platform because when it comes to handgun shooting, that's what I learned to shoot well with. If I learned to shoot well with a Glock, I'd probably carry a Glock regularly. If I learned to shoot well with an XDM or an XD, I'd carry an XD regularly. But that's the that's where we go back to our training. My comfort zone is what I learned to, is what I trained with. I guarantee you that I am more at home driving a standard than I am an automatic. I do have a vehicle with each transmission though, and I can drive them equally well. I can shoot the Glock as well as I can shoot the 1911. But the truth of the matter is, if I'm going to be in a fight and I need to operate a gun instinctively, the 1911 is one that I I know it better. Let's move on from the hipster guns. Because talking about what I carry, because that's what I learned to train or what I trained on and learned on, just because that's the reason I do it, doesn't mean that it's a choice based on a hipster gun. The hipsters will choose something just because it's different. And they'll talk about, well, it just works. And they'll spell works with W-E-R-K-S or, you know, they got to do something different here. Well, another factor in hipster gun culture or gun culture 2.1 is snark. They like to be snarky. You know, you'll have, uh, I'll touch on comments like this later, but name calling as part of the snark or uh, call snark shark, uh, shark value, shark shock, blah. Call it shock value. They'll say something to shock people to draw attention. Gun bloggers are notoriously snarky. Now, snark can be entertaining, but it can be highly offensive. You know, I made a comment once, mommy's demanding illegal loving as a reference for mom's demand action. And I'll touch on the logic behind me making that comment later, but that was a bit of snark. And this podcast would have been better off if I'd never said it. I didn't get, I did not get hate mail from it. I didn't even get negative comments about it, but it was not the thing I should have said. You'll also see other examples of snark and I'll go into, I've got a whole section I'm typing up right now for examples and we'll touch on those in a moment. Another group are the would-be revolutionaries. These are the folks, well, the American people are going to wake up and I hope I'm, um, I hope I'm there when they do because I'm going to lead the charge. Oh, bull. These are the same people that are saying, well, our founding fathers would have been shooting already. Really? One of the big things in with our founding fathers that led them to start shooting was the whole taxation without representation. We have that representation. There's still a chance we can fix this without shooting. If our founding fathers had that capability, they wouldn't have been shooting when they were. And then we come to the in-your-face antics. This is where you have somebody, they do something just to get attention whether it's for themselves or a cause or even a movement. In-your-face antics never help whatever you're trying to draw attention to. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. You almost always draw negative attention. Some people will say, well, the gay rights movement. No, the gay rights movement really started moving when they quit doing the in-your-face antics. Almost the moment they dropped the in-your-face antics, the gay rights movement took off. They became normal people. When you become normal people instead of a bunch of people in tight little short shorts with their hands in somebody else's shorts that are the same gender as them, walking down the street waving rainbow flags and kissing and scaring little children, when you quit doing stuff like that, you you tend to become more normal. When you become more normal, you become more acceptable. When you become more acceptable... Whatever you're doing becomes more of the norm. It's a circle. And it's self it's a self feeding circle. But here's some examples where we have had where we can see some problems. As I said, I made the mommies demanding illegal loving from mayors in every town comment. Well, 
I've made this reference more than once, and in all honesty, I should never have made it. While my goal was to illustrate the, the various groups Michael Bloomberg funds and that they're actually all just one effort on his part, uh, it's demeaning, it's hateful, and it's rude, and I should never have made that reference. Anyone that's apologize, uh, Anybody that's offended by it, well, I'm apologizing for it. But then we have the Gunblog Variety Cast. On episode 94, they have a segment called The Bridge. And there's a link. I'm going to throw that link in the show notes. But the thing about The Bridge segment, we have someone talking about a politician that's rude, hateful, and another politician that's civil. The hateful politician turned her off. The civil politician, well, she sent, uh, she sent him thank yous for being civil, even though she disagreed with him and he was on the anti-gun side. It was our guy that was turning her off. Now, fortunately, her position was not one to be swayed by the behavior of the politician, but instead her position was the one to be swayed by the issue. But also on the gun blog variety cast, we have, we have had references from them where someone's, and it's one of the main hosts, He's made a comment about an inability to use birth control as being a qualify. Uh, why that? Why is that a qualifier to make somebody an expert on gun control or something like that? It's funny that the same podcast where you have someone pitching the, where they're actually pitching something turns them off. Another host, a uh, episode of three back, is doing the same thing, and this is an example of the right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing. This is an example of why we cannot have this kind of behavior. Now, there's a gun blog out there, and they took it from a Twitter comment, but they have called Michelle Viscusi, and this is a young lady that's been on Top Shots. She's on Team Glock's professional shooting team. I mean, this woman's a professional competitive shooter. She's a model, or at least I understand she is, and she's she's very well known in the shooting world. Maybe not as well known as... Jerry Micklick, but she's well known in the shooting world. But this particular blog refers to her as Tactical Snooky. And that's hateful. That is downright hateful. Why why are why are we referred to her as a tactical snooky? Is it because she's of Italian descent? At least that's what her last name indicates. Is it because her because she has proportions similar to the reality show character from Jersey Shore? I don't know. But the funny thing is, I don't see the blog writer showing off a Team Glock shirt or a Team Smith & Wesson shirt or a Team Anything shirt from any major manufacturer. But let's look at some antic or some in-your-face antics examples. You know what? Let's start with Stickland. Jonathan Stickland here in Texas. Also, let's talk about Corey Watkins and their effort and the efforts of Stickland and Watkins with the unlicensed carry in the 2015 legislative session. Now, it was more than them involved in this, but they're the ones we're going to talk about here because they're the best examples. You see, Corey Watkins went into a state representative's office with a bunch of other people, started a scene. They were told to leave. They would go outside, but they wouldn't let the uh, representative shut his door. In fact, Corey Watkins put his foot in the door to keep the uh, representative from shutting it. And I'll throw a link in to, about, to a story on theblaze.com where this didn't exactly help matters. But first, I want to run an audio clip that tells you why unlicensed carry is dead in Texas until at least 2017, and probably after that for a little while. And that audio clip is Representative Phillips and Representative Stickland. I've played this before, but this is the results of in-your-face tactics and in general, having a lack of civility. Questions on the bill. Representative Phillips, I appreciate your efforts on this bill. You know that I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. You know that I have been working very hard for open carry for Texans. We disagreed on the way to go about that. I was just curious on a personal level. I know that you have maintained that this bill was specifically about license holders. You know my argument is is different and that we shouldn't have the license to begin with. Will you honestly work with me? 
Will you, will you give my bill a hearing in your committee so that we can have that discussion? You know that I am going to support your bill today because it's an advancement of Second Amendment rights, but there are literally tens of thousands of people who Mr. believe we Mr. need to go to more. Will you work with me, Representative Phillips? Let me answer that. Mr. Stickland, uh, the fate of your bill was cast when the Senate decided they were not going to take up constitutional carry. I'm not going to argue with you. Your fate was treated as how you treated members on this floor as it related to your legislation and other legislation. It's also how those that support your amendment have treated members of this House, their families, and our staff, that there is no reason when there's other members who've worked hard, who try to work with each other, they have to have a chance to have, to have their hearing. They're going to get a hearing. And now you see why unlicensed or as some people call it, constitutional carry, is dead, at least for this for the time being. But you also see the results of a lack of civility. we got to fix this. And the way we fix it is we return to the big tent philosophy. We accept everyone irregardless of how they are. If someone has in the past been anti-gun or supported a position that wasn't as far as conservative as we would like, we still welcome them, welcome them in. We don't necessarily have to trust them. We don't trust anybody, not when it comes to our rights. But we get a chance to educate these folks. We work with them. We teach them this is where we're at. This is what we want to do. This is who we are. And when we bring back the big tent philosophy, that is when people start feeling welcome again. And we want to make everyone feel welcome. This is who we are. We're a group that tries as gun owners, we are a group that tries to make people feel welcome, feel safe, and understand that as long as they're with us, we will look out for them. Finally, what we got to do is we got to turn down the hate and the vitriol. We got to turn up the friendly and the welcome. I can't say the friendly and the welcome enough. We have to be friendlier. We have to welcome people in. If Bloomberg all of a sudden decides he's opening up a gun store, are we going to trust him? No. Are we going to welcome him in to the gun rights community if he's wanting, if he makes a, oh, let's say $500 million donation to the NRA and he suddenly dissolves Moms Demand Action and all of his other groups? Yeah, we would welcome him in. If he had a sudden change of heart, yes, we would welcome him in. Not because we want his money, but because we don't want the enemy. We don't want anybody viewing themselves as our enemy. We cannot have enemies. In fact, when we look at someone, we don't look at them as an enemy. We look at them as an opponent. Enemies you can never reconcile with. Opponents, well, people are always open to changing their position to that of their opponent. You know what? I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. And then we'll come back. We'll hit our second topic, and then we'll wrap the show up. The second topic is one that I was working on for a future episode, and it's only a portion of that topic. But we're going to... We're going to use that as a second topic on this one, and then I'll, and before we do that, I'll explain why. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com, or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-292. 6736. Okay, let me give you a little bit of an explanation before we go on. Our news girl sent me an email telling me that her computer had a hard drive fail and that she lost our news archives for this episode. And now that she knows why I insist on us using Google Docs for this. She also told me no more fake names. One of them got a little too close to her actual middle name for her comfort. With that in mind, let's consider some things we can do to prepare for failure while we carry. It just seemed like a good topic to bring up since we didn't have news because of a failure. Now, there's standard considerations you can, uh, or standard things you can consider to, uh, to prepare for the failure when you're carrying a firearm. The first and most obvious is to carry a backup gun. Also, carrying a reload, especially if you're carrying a semi-auto. Uh, an extra magazine or two? Great idea, because magazines are the number one source of failure in semi-autos. A lot of people don't realize this. They think it's the, you know, this particular design or 
that model or something like that. But no, it's a magazine. Another thing you can consider is a failure drill. And there's failure drills for all firearms. Everybody's heard of the tap rack bang for a semi-auto. I forget the name of it, but if I have a revolver <laughs> malfunction, I've got a, I've actually got a failure drill built in where basically I slap the cylinder hard. Well, it's complicated. I've discussed it in earlier episodes, I believe, if not this podcast on another one. But there are failure drills for revolvers. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the cylinder to turn if it doesn't if it doesn't turn like it's supposed to. And I don't want to discuss it from memory because I haven't I actually have not committed myself to practicing this because I don't carry a revolver well very often anymore. In the last year and a half, I can't think of a single time I've carried a revolver, and I don't want to leave a step out of the failure drill for a revolver if I'm going to talk about the failure drill. But a number of things can lead to a revolver failing. Most often, it's a gun that has a lot of recoil and not enough crimp in the uh, case around the bullet. What happens is when you have have a lot of recoil and no crimp around the bullet case or the, around the bullet with the case, the bullet works out of the case under uh, all the guns being fired. And then the bullet gets caught up and doesn't allow the cylinder tur- to turn. Well, there's a failure drill that will hopefully get your gun back into the fight at least for another shot or two. But then there's an there's more than just failure drills. You can carry a knife. You carry it as a tool and you also carry it as a weapon because if for some reason your gun or guns do not function and you don't or you don't have them, even the smallest of knives can be uh, one of the most intimidating of weapons. And then there's maintenance. Maintenance is the best way to prevent failure. And all I'm talking about is when you perform maintenance, clean and inspect your equipment, even when it hasn't been used. One time we were practicing drawing our carry weapons and shooting them at the range. And we started out with our carry ammo because, well, you want to make sure from time to time that your carry ammo still functions in your firearm and that the new box that you've bought, which you should buy multiple boxes and put at least one, preferably two, through the firearm before you go ahead and carry that ammunition again. We were practicing this and we were practicing drawing and firing our carry weapons. I drew, I fired, and there was a smell of burning lint. Well, we took the gun apart and there was tons of lint in the gun. How how only some of it went up, I don't know. If you don't know anything about lint, you have to understand lint is probably the most flammable substance on the planet. If you even look at it with a little bit of ignition, it'll go up. And while we're there, let's do a little public service announcement here and warn everybody to clean their dryer traps, clean their dryer hose, and the dryer vent. We just don't want any house fires destroying valuable firearms and ammunition. But any time you go through and you do cleaning and maintenance, always inspect your equipment, look for cracks, look for areas of rust. Anytime you find something, fix it. It's not that hard. Now, one thing I was touching I was planning to do in this uh, failure consideration is address some myths and rumors that people think might cause a failure. One thing people will say, well, cycle your ammo in your magazines to avoid the spring getting weak from being compressed. Well, this is not the case. Springs fail from metal fatigue. Metal fatigue is caused by repeated movement. Take a paper clip, bend it, put it back where it was, bend it, put it back where it was. Do this real fast several times. It'll break. Take one of those pieces, do it the same number of times slowly. It may not break, but it'll be a lot weaker if it doesn't break. And it may break. It may break sooner. You see, it's the repeated cycling that causes the spring to get weak and break. Now, a actual valid concern you can have with a loaded magazine causing failure are the feed lips. The feed lips can fail because they'll be pushed out of spec if loaded mags are not kept in a firearm or mag holder. And the mag holder has to press the top cartridge inwards away from the feed lips to keep pressure off of them. Another myth, and I've heard this one repeated very recently. Another myth I've heard is 1911s carried cocked and locked for a year and need to have a mainspring replaced. Once again, this is about uh, the spring being cycled causing a problem, not the spring being compressed. Consider your vehicle. There are a lot of springs in your vehicle. Your engine has valve springs. Look at how many RPMs your motor's turning. Let's say your motor's running at 2,500 RPMs. 
Okay. Every valve spring in that motor is being compressed and decompressed 1,250 times if your engine is running at 2,500 RPMs. You now, some people say, well, that's only half of the RPMs. Yes, it is. That's because the camshaft turns at half the speed of the crank. If you're not a car person, disregard the logic and all and just take my word for it. If you're a car person, you'll understand what I'm saying. These springs do not fail, and they don't fail when you're sitting there and some of them are in various states of compression. Some might even be fully compressed. Some may not be compressed beyond what it takes to keep them in place. But your car also has a number of different springs in the suspension. Some of them are flat. Well, it depends on your vehicle. Let's say you have an older pickup. I have a 2011 Ford Ranger. It still has leaf springs. These are flat curved pieces of metal, several of them together, and they connect the axle to the body or to the frame of the pickup. Up front, there's a set of coil, spr coil springs for the front suspension. Now, these springs are constantly moving, but you don't see people with a vehicle that sat for 56, you know, for 50 years worried about the springs being bad. There's other things that go bad from sitting, like rubber and organic materials. The springs are just fine. What I'm getting at, the failure of a spring is going to happen after use. Springs used in the engine of your vehicle or in the suspension of your vehicle, they're made with a lot of material. I mean, a whole lot of material. And they are made this way so that they become more reliable. Now, a firearm is a very intricate system, and it's a very simple system. But the springs in a firearm are made so that you're able to carry it. This means that they don't put a lot of material in these springs. As a result, replacing the springs in a firearm is always a smart thing to do. Once that firearm's been used enough, if you don't have at least 2,000 rounds to a firearm, there's not really a need to worry about replacing springs. In fact, it's going to take up even more than that to really get it where you're going to concern yourself with worry. Well, let's talk about some more myths. Ammo goes bad with time. Not really. I have heard stories where they're getting a ship ready to be sent to the breakers, and they find uh, the arms room to still be equipped. The, strip, the ship wasn't completely stripped down like it was supposed to be. So the naval crew that's stripping the uh, ship down for the breakers, they go, they take the ammunition, they load it into some of the firearms, and they just empty the rounds in, by firing them into the ocean. Guess what? I have no reason to believe that this story would be impossible. I have, I have actually purchased ammunition that was over 50 years old and fired it. As long as you're comfortable, the ammo's comfortable. And you see, ammunition's bothered more by temperature. As a result, extreme temperatures will affect the powder and the primer more than age. As long as the ammunition's kept somewhere where it's not too hot and not too cold, it'll be good. Now let's talk about one that a lot of people will argue over. In my opinion, it's more of a, it's more of a personal preference and where you're at with your training. A lot of people will tell you it's safer and better to carry it with an empty chamber. Experts, and by experts I mean people that teach the carrying of firearms and how to use them if you carry them, they tend to recommend carrying with a loaded chamber. However, I will say carrying a handgun with an empty chamber is likely better than not carrying a firearm at all should you need it. Now, these folks that point out that, well, it's safer to carry with an empty chamber, will almost always say, well, in Hunter's Ed, or this hunting magazine or whatever, it recommended that you keep your chamber empty. Well, in that instance, they're right. You see, when you're carrying a long gun, it's not in a holster. The trigger is exposed. You might have a branch get into the trigger guard, and a branch will work just as good as a, as a finger if the right direction is, or force is applied in the right direction. So in all honesty, when you're carrying a long gun, yeah, it's best to carry it with an empty chamber. However, if you're carrying a handgun, it's in a holster. The trigger is covered. If it's got a safety, the safety is more than likely going to be on, and you don't have to worry about it. So how do you, uh, how do you uh, plan for failure? You identify where you may have a failure. You take steps to mitigate the cause of that failure, and you take steps to mitigate the consequences of that failure. Essentially, you're talking equipment, maintenance, and training. 
a good rule of thumb is one is none, two is one. With that said, I'm going to wrap this show up. And, uh, well, until next time, stay safe, carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.